Look at that. Whoa! You know, burning water is actually very simple. You don't burn it like this, of course. What you do is you break the H2O molecule in half using electrons. That process is called hydrolysis, and all you have to do is stick two pieces of metal into water and connect them to a battery. The gases that come out are hydrogen and oxygen, and those two together burn very well. <laughs> this video was brought to you by Trainwell. This design is of course a little bit crappy, but I have a great idea to make this better. We'll come back to this in a minute. Well, now, why would I want to burn water? Well, one of the reasons has a weird name. Stoichiometry. Stoichiometry means that by splitting water, you get the perfect amount of oxygen to burn the perfect amount of hydrogen. That's needed all, but that's not the real reason why I want to burn water. The real reason is, hydrogen is really, really powerful. This is one kilogram of bananas, which has around 900 calories, and calories is a unit of energy, and energy is universal meaning that it works for food, but it also works for fuels. So I can basically say that this kilogram of gasoline has 11,000 calories. That's worse than peanut butter. Can you imagine how many calories there's in a kilogram of hydrogen? Well, it would make you fat pretty quickly. It has 34,000 calories. That's three times more than the amount gasoline has. We should probably use hydrogen for everything, right? Well, it's not very easy to get a kilogram of hydrogen. You see, a kilogram of gasoline fits neatly inside a soda bottle, but to get one kilogram of hydrogen, you would have to fill an entire room. Okay, maybe not this room, probably Harry Potter's room. Hydrogen is normally a gas, and gases are not very dense, but even if I went to the extreme of cooling it down to minus 250 degrees Celsius to make it a liquid, it would still need a 10 liter jug just to get a kilogram. Water, on the other hand, has a lot of hydrogen, already has oxygen to burn it, and it's pretty easy to find. I want to burn water because I want to build a powerful rocket engine. Come here. You see, I found this service online called JLC 3DP that 3D prints stainless steel parts pretty cheaply. How cheaply do you ask? Well, I designed a simple rocket to give it a test and order the part using the website, and it only cost me 35 euros. For metal 3D printing. Isn't that insane? Yes, it is. The part arrived pretty quickly and I got very excited. <laughs> the rocket looks great and the dimensions were spot on. Also, I got this spanner wrench ring that I designed myself. Finally, I have a way to 3D print metal that doesn't cost me my house. If you want to 3D print these, um, you can find the files in the description. Okie dokie, I have my rocket. And now I need my fuel. And by fuel I mean an HHO generator. Like I said before, this design is a bit crappy. I need to improve it. So I went to the place where you go to get good ideas. YouTube. I found some cool stuff. Some of these designs use washers, and they stack them up to get more surface area and thus more gas. Water is not really good at conducting electricity, so almost all of them use sodium hydroxide to make it more conductive. Hands down, my favorite design was made by Ben from the YouTube channel Nighthawk in Light. He uses stainless steel scouring pads as electrodes. And it's genius, because they're super cheap and they have an insane amount of surface area, which means a lot of gas. Great, I can just use two scouring pads as electrodes, and I'll get a lot of gas, right? Yes and no. Well, after seeing all of that, I got an idea. By putting sodium hydroxide in the water, you're making it conductive, but there's still a resistance. The farther away the electrodes are from each other, the more voltage you need to push through that resistance. Meaning, you want the electrodes very close to each other. What I need is a design that is like two scouring pads interlocked with each other, without touching each other, so I can produce a lot of gas very efficiently. I thought about it for a while, and then it hit me. Lattices. More specifically, 3D lattices. They are these self-repeating 3D structures that are normally light, strong, and have a lot of surface area. And the queen of the lattices is this one. The gyroid. The gyroid is an infinitely connected, triply periodic minimal surface. <sighs> Long category. It was discovered by a NASA scientist in the 70s called Alan Schoen. Schoen? Schoen? This is a very lightweight, strong geometry that is used in many structural applications, but I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the fact that it has a lot of surface area and divides space into two different volumes. This is a gyroid block. If I fill the space inside of it, I get these two volumes, blue and orange. Now, if I remove the gyroid, I'm left with these two lattices that intertwine with each other very closely, but never touch. Do you see where I'm going with this? 
I can use this anti-gyroid as electrodes and get exactly what I want. Sponsor time. This is me four years ago, and this is me last year. The difference is that I started going to the gym, and what I did at the gym didn't really burn a lot of calories, but what it did was, it got me out of the house, it made me tired, which means I slept better, I felt better, and I didn't really feel the need to eat all the time. I think the hardest part of going to the gym for the first time was the fact that I didn't really know what to do or how to do it. So back in 2021, I got a personal trainer, and it worked, but it was a bit expensive. It doesn't need to be though. By the end of last year, I stopped going to the gym. I lost the habit, and I felt it pretty quickly. I gained weight, and I couldn't sleep very well. But now, I'm back on the horse, and that's because of Trainwell. Trainwell, formerly known as Copilot, is this app that connects you with a personal trainer. Mine is Mike. We started off with an onboarding call so Mike could know what I wanted and what normally makes me miss out the workouts. This is why I say it's, it's a great thing if this is happening because it's kind of it's going to be like a push to, to send me in the right direction again. Yeah, I'm really excited that you're getting back into it now. Um, are you looking to get back into the gym or what is that going to look like for you? After that, Mike prepared custom workouts for me that I can do at the gym or at home. The app shows you exactly how to do the exercises, what equipment to use, how much weight to put on, and most importantly, how much time to rest. If you feel something isn't right, you can always message your personal trainer or even edit the workout yourself. I know you might feel like working out is not really for you and it's too much work, but that's exactly how I felt about creating this YouTube channel. And now, I'm very glad I did. If you want to give it a try, go to the description and click my Trainwell link. go.trainwell.net slash Intexa to get 14 days for free with your own expert personal trainer. You won't regret it. Back to the video. This is a unit cell for a gyroid. I had to watch a tutorial to model this. And because the gyroid is self-repeating, I can just copy and paste this cell in all directions and subtract it from a shape to get the anti-gyroid. Or so I thought. To get a lot of surface area with this lattice, I need to make the cells very tiny, which means I need thousands of them. I tried modeling this on my 3D modeling app, but when I tried to pattern this in all directions, the app pooped its pants and crashed. Apparently to 3D model lattices like this, you need another type of 3D modeling. It's called implicit 3D modeling. And I know that because of Tom. Not that Tom. The other Tom. I met Tom at this 3D printing convention called Formnext. He works in a company called Metafold 3D. They are experts in 3D lattices and implicit modeling. They basically help other companies and researchers solve engineering problems with lattices. It was actually Tom that told me about the anti-gyroid lattice. It's not called anti-gyroid lattice, by the way. It's called I2I lattice. But I think anti-gyroid sounds cooler. I asked for his help and he let me use their modeling app to get my anti-gyroid. Their cloud-based app is awesome, and it didn't poop its pants, by the way. I got my file and I used my most precise printer to print it. This is the Form 4 from Form Labs. It's fast, it's precise, and it prints resin. Right, I have my 3D printed lattice in resin. But now I have a problem, which is resin is not conductive, and my electrodes need to be. Not to worry though, I had this problem before. A few videos ago, I used electroplating to add a layer of copper to my iron thruster that was also resin 3D printed. To do that, you paint the part with an electrically conductive paint, you put it in a copper solution, and you pass electricity through it. The problem is that in that project I used this conductive spray paint, and in this case I can't really spray paint that. To get all the surface covered, I need to dip it. I smell the spray, and I got some hints of varnish, acetone, and graphite. Okay, you got me, I read the label. I tried several combinations of varnish, graphite and acetone, but it was taking a lot of time to get mediocre results. The paint was either too thick or not conductive enough. In the words of my grandfather, if the grapes are more expensive than the wine, just buy a bottle. So I bought a bottle. I actually bought several bottles of different brands of conductive paint. I tested them all and the best one was this one called Leaky Wire. It's very thin and super conductive. I gave it a test using this model of an handsome man I found online and it worked pretty well. Now, do you remember how I said that normally everyone uses sodium hydroxide to make the water conductive? I actually found a much better solution to sodium hydroxide. With just a little bit of this thing, you can make the water very conductive. And I kind of understand why other people wouldn't like to mess with it. It's high concentration sulfuric acid. If you had just a teeny tiny bit of sulfuric acid to distilled water, it makes it super conductive. The only problem is that the acid is very corrosive, meaning it's gonna destroy my copper layer. To solve this, I bought this solution that adds a thin layer of silver metal to copper parts. Just like that. It's like magic. And the best part about this is that silver is immune to sulfuric acid. Okie dokie, my silver lattice is now ready for testing. I put it inside this very well-sealed acrylic enclosure so I can see what's going on inside. 
Now, before I test this, I need to say something. This is gonna produce hydrogen, which is a very powerful fuel, but it's also producing oxygen, and the two together are super dangerous. Don't try this at home unless you know exactly what you're doing. I never say this on my channel, but this is an exception. Okay, so this already has conductive water. I connected the generator to a syringe so I can measure how much gas I'm generating per minute. And I have my power supply here. Uh, let's give it a go. I'm gonna start with three volts. Oh, it's going. And that's one minute. Okay, about 50 cc per minute. I'm not even sure if that's great or not. Um, yeah. Whoa! 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 Okay, I'm gonna give it a try with this uh, lithium battery. It has 7.4 volts and I think it allows more current, so we should get more gas. I think I'm getting limited by the power source. Whoa! Look at the difference. Yeah, I'm guessing I was limited by the current. Wow, the battery's getting hot. Look how red that is. I don't even know what's happening there. I'm guessing the silver is oxidizing and is leaving behind the copper. But then again, I thought silver was more resistant to corrosion than copper, so I have no idea. So I was curious about that red stuff that was forming. Uh, I thought it was the silver coming off, but it's not. It's some kind of deposit because I can wash it away. Look, you see? Okay, so I did some research and apparently silver doesn't really react with sulfuric acid, but it does react a lot with sulfur, which is being released during the um, hydrolysis. I didn't know that. Um, I just read that on an article right now. Okay, I guess I'm gonna go back to the sodium hydroxide. So, I found this alchemy spell online that uses salt, baking soda, aluminum and boiling water to remove tarnish from silver. That's what's going on here. In the meantime, I'm gonna use my replacement lattice. Oh yeah, of course, I have a replacement. What do you think, I'm an idiot? I'm an idiot, yes, but I'm a prepared one. Actually, I'm prepared because I know I'm an idiot. Pouring water into my generator. Let's hope it doesn't get destroyed this time. Because this lattice is a lot of work to do. This time, instead of red, it's turning black? Is that better or worse? Yeah, this is no longer conducting electricity. Something is wrong. So it's happening the same thing again. The silver is not getting destroyed, but it's getting covered in this sludge. I don't know what it is, and I don't know how to fix it. This was a good idea, but it was short-lived. It works, but just for a while. Uh, it doesn't matter, because I just realized something. This is not the best way of getting the most surface area of a certain geometry. Just think about it. If you have a cylinder, the best way of getting the most surface area in there is to stack a bunch of very thin discs on top of each other that are separated by a very small gap. Half is connected to positive, the other half is connected to negative, and jada, perfect generator. My lattice is contained in a cylinder of 60 mm in diameter and 100 mm in height, and it has about 132 square inches of surface area. To get the same area with 60 mm discs, provided that I use 0.1 mm sheet steel, I would only need 15 discs to get the same area. Even if I use 2 mm spacing between them, that would only be 32 mm high. Now I have to test this. I guess I'm building another generator. To make the discs, I only need to print out a template, glue it to a 0.1 sheet of steel, cut it, drill it, and repeat that 15 times. It's boring, but very simple. For the spacers, I could just use an outer ring with holes on the perimeter, but the steel discs are too thin and need support all over, and not just on the outer edge. Instead, I designed the 1.3 mm thick gyroid spacer. In this way, the disc has support all over, and because of the unique geometry of the gyroid, the gas doesn't get trapped. I am actually pretty proud about this design. Nonetheless, the gyroid spacer is stealing a little bit of surface area, so instead of 15, I did 30. The spacers I printed in my Form 4 in batches of 10. That was easy, the hard part was removing all the support material by hand. It took me an entire morning to do that. Don't forget to subscribe. So, this works like this. This rod will be connected to positive, and this one will be connected to negative. I place a spacer and a disc. The disc has a small hole and a big hole. That is so it touches one of the rods, but not the other. On the next disc, I do the opposite. Big hole on this side and small hole on this side. Right now, I have a positive disc and a negative disc. 
Now I just need to repeat this 14 more times. The last one. Nice, it's looking good. I'm really hoping this works because this was a lot of work. Okay, this is ready to go. I'm really hoping this works. Let's give it a go. New design, new hope. Three, two, one. Look at that. Wow. That's so much more gas. The battery is getting hot though. I'm gonna have to stop. But look, it is 150 and a minute hasn't passed by yet. Design. This design is a win. Look at that. Oh my god. Did you listen to this? It doesn't even compare to the other one. This is 100% oxyhydrogen. Jesus. <laughs> okay, now it's time to connect this to my rocket engine. For the injector, I machined the plate in aluminium. I couldn't fit a regular spark plug in here, so I made one myself using a steel straw from Ikea, some plaster and copper wire. It works pretty well. Okay, I know this is a little bit of a mess right now, this is still not wired, but I'm using an Arduino to control uh, the arc lighter that is going to do the spark, um, the relay that is going to control the generator, and the electro valve. Uh, the generator is going to be switched on and off uh, when the valve is on, so I can save current and also be safer. I also have a flashback arrestor valve, and the generator is down there to be also safer. Let's give it a go. <laughs> Poor Joel! Wee! Okay, I need to update you on something. So, first of all, there's no way the sound I'm hearing here is translating to there, to you. Because this is so loud. This is pure detonation. I mean, this kind of reminds me of my pulse detonation engine. So, second of all, um, my power source wasn't really handling uh, the amperage this was pulling, so I used this battery which is a 12 volt battery that can um, basically discharge 40 amperes, which is a lot, but still couldn't make it. It got destroyed after three tests. This pulls a lot of current. So I upgraded to its big brother, this one, which is a 15 volt battery and can pull up to 400 amperes and still couldn't make it, it died. Um, this is pulling too much current. I don't really know what's the solution for that right now, but this is really promising. I just really need to find a solution, I guess. This was an insane project. And I guess this is just the beginning. Maybe you can improve on it with a little bit of creativity and 3D printing. If you don't have a 3D printer, you're a lucky one. I'm giving one away in this video. And all you have to do to win it is subscribe to the channel, leave a like in this video, and post a comment suggesting a theme for a future video. The most liked comment will win a brand new 3D printer. On that note, a big thanks to Trainwell for sponsoring this video. And don't forget to click my Trainwell link in the description to get 14 days for free with your own expert personal trainer. Also, a big thanks to you for watching. And remember, tomatoes are disgusting. See ya!